Hello everybody, this is Mustafa Farid. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm a radiology assistant lecturer at Saint Chaps University. At Saint Chaps University, I'm currently receiving my training as an interventional neuroradiologist. This is the summer of September 2015. Beautiful weather. Cerebral hemorrhage occurs due to rupture of blood vessels. Blood vessels can be arteries or veins. Arteries and veins differ in their microstructure and in the pressure of blood that flows into them. This is a cross section of the head. Between the brain and the calvarial bone lies the three membranes that surround the brain, the dura, arachnoid, and the pia, from outward to inward. Between the arachnoid and the pia lies the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space is composed of multiple septi, where the CSF floats in between, as seen in this image. We move to the next image, where you can see the blood vessels, or the arteries here specifically, each taking its course along the surface of the brain. This image and others were drawn in this manner to anatomically identify different arteries, but in real life these vessels run in the subarachnoid space we mentioned in the previous slide and not directly on the surface of the brain. This is beautifully shown here in this micro diagram. Notice how the branching arteries dives in the sulcus to supply the brain. The same micro diagram, but the artery contains an aneurysm. That's why when a cerebral arterial aneurysm ruptures, a patient gets a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The same applies to veins, such as arteries. They travel in the subarachnoid space. These veins, in turn, in the subarachnoid space, drain in the dural venous sinuses. Okay, now we move to another topic. If you take a close look at the brain stem and the inferior brain surface, you'll notice multiple tiny holes. Entering these holes are the perforating arteries. These are small caliber and arteries that arise from a few cerebral arteries, like the basilar artery and the MCA. Here we can see the lenticular striate arteries. They are perforating arteries that supply the basal ganglia. Now that we understand some basic anatomy regarding the arteries and veins, we can start discussing cerebral hemorrhage. As seen here and the next slide, two examples of cerebral hemorrhages in the basal ganglia, mainly due to perforation of one of the lenticular striate arteries. Just the same image as the previous one, but on coronal CT. CT is the best modality to detect acute hemorrhage, which appears hyperdense at that time. Another hyperdense basal ganglia hematoma appearing here on this axial CT. But if you take a closer look, there is a faint hypodense rim, ill-defined. This is a sign of hematoma evolution, meaning that this hematoma is less acute than the one we saw in the previous slide. Notice here, the perihematoma hypodense rim has become more thick and well-defined, denoting more evolution. Hematomas evolve from periphery to center. So what does hematoma evolution mean? It is the change in the physiologic state of hemoglobin, or to be more precise, the iron atom in the heme group. Hemoglobin passes into four states, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and hemosiderin. This plays a major role in the hematoma appearance on MRI. Hematoma appearance by MRI is due to the hematoma microstructure and the number of unpaired electrons in the iron atom of hemoglobin. Unpaired electrons creates a paramagnetic field that leads to signal loss in T2 weighted image and blooming in T2 star. The time period of hematoma evolution follows the rule of three, which is first three hours in hyperacute, three days in acute, and three weeks in subacute. Hyperacute hematomas are all oxyhemoglobin. That means there is no unpaired electrons in the hemoglobin. T1 is iso and T2 is slightly hyper intense. 
due to the inherent microstructure of the hematoma. It may also reveal restricted diffusion depending on the hematoma viscosity. A distinguishing feature of hyperacute hematoma is the hypointense rim of the oxyhemoglobin surrounding it. Moving on to acute hematomas, which are the oxyhemoglobin that contains unpaired electrons, it's hypo in T2 and isointense on T1. As for subacute hematomas that are methemoglobin, which contains unpaired electrons, it's hypo on T2, but this time it's hyper on T1 due to interactions between the hemoglobin and water molecules. This is clearly seen here in this T1 image that shows a hematoma with a hyperintense margin of hemoglobin and an isocenter of deoxyhemoglobin. As for the final stage of hemoglobin evolution, the hemoglobin degrades and the released iron is transformed to hemosiderin that is phagocytosed by the tissue macrophages. Hemosiderin is super paramagnetic and causes severe blooming on T2. After reviewing the MR appearance of cerebral hematomas, we move to a clinical point. That is, cerebral hemorrhage can have a spectrum of presentations, ranging from completely no symptoms to major symptoms like paralysis, coma, or even death. Hematomas themselves produce focal neurologic deficits, depending on their site, yet they can also lead to herniation when present at certain locations and expand at a certain rate. Here we can see this hematoma causing sign herniation and here downward transcentorial uncle herniation. In these cases of fatal mass effect, surgical suction and evacuation is performed after proper planning of the safest access path.